for another chance. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, I'm, I'm here for the ride. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for ONLA webinars. We have a great webinar for you today. It is major disease problems in the landscape and a few from the nurseries in 2020, uh, courtesy of Jen Olson. So Jen, thanks for joining us. No problem. I'm, I'm excited to do this. Uh, I'll warn you now, if you hear any crazy things in the background, we're getting some renovation work done. Uh, so if it sounds like something's being destroyed, it probably is, uh, but I'm using the headset, so hopefully you won't hear them. Um, I tried to put this together so there would be a little bit of something for all audiences um, with regards to nursery, landscape, and retail. Um, and then if we just have any other master gardeners or people like that that listen. And I'm the director of the Plant Disease and Insect Diagnostic Lab, what we call the PADIDL. And so I looked back at what we've had coming in over the past year, and in some cases, what that's going to mean for uh, the winter and next year. And so uh, the first thing, it, I'll give you a little outline. This is what we're going to go over. We're going to talk about the ice storm and some other different tree problems on oak trees, blue atlas, a very brief P. remorum update, moving into some fruit tree problems, especially pear rust, and then just finishing up with some other leaf spot and anthracnose issues. So uh, we just, much of the state just experienced a big ice storm. This is the same tree during the ice storm on the left, after the ice storm on the right. So even though it kind of stood back up, there's a lot of damage there. And if you're not aware, I wanted to just remind everyone that we do have this fact sheet on managing storm damaged trees that you can just Google and find or the web address is there. And so that might be helpful if either for yourself or if you have clients that are trying to make decisions. And probably the biggest decision, which some people have already made, is whether they're going to try to rehabilitate or remove. And anytime something's hazardous, we're going to want to remove that tree. Uh, but when we're trying to make the decision, some of the things that are talked about in that fact sheet is what's the potential growth rate of this current tree versus a new tree? Um, is it ever going to look right again? And in the case of something like this, this may not be the best specimen anyway, because we don't have one dominant central leader. That's probably why it had a lot of damage. Uh, but if we focus on this half of the tree, there's a lot of uh, bark that's been stripped off from one of the trunks. And if this isn't addressed, it's going to cause problems down the road. So even though a lot of people are cleaning up what they see as the immediate mess, this is gonna be a problem in the future. And we'll get into a little bit more of that. Um, for those individuals that have decided to go through removal, as you're uh, selecting trees or products to carry or uh, making recommendations, I encourage you to think about trees that are less prone to storm damage, whether it's an ice, this is probably in four years, at least the fourth ice storm that at least some part of the state has experienced. And so this is becoming a common occurrence for us. And we always have our typical high winds and uh, tornadic activity and things like that. And although people might ask us, hey, I want a, you know, I want a bulletproof tree. I want a tornado proof tree. That's not really possible. Uh, if I could find that, it's probably going to be made of metal. Um, but th the different groups, forestry service, things like that, have put together lists like this that kind of show relative susceptibility and resistance of some of the more common trees that are used in the landscape. And so although this isn't going to be a perfect list, um, it at least gives you some options. Uh, and this was made by someone out of Illinois. So some of these may not be as appropriate here, but we may have some cousins that are. Um, and I do know that 
that our own Oklahoma Forestry Services is trying to collect the same information, looking at trees that have held up well versus those uh, that were more severely damaged. And so hopefully we'll see uh, more Oklahoma type list in the future, but things like this can be used right now just to try to select plants that are less prone to storm damage. And in general, anytime we think about uh, how trees grow, avoiding trees that are genetically prone to a lot of included bark is one reason why trees have problems uh, from storm damage. So something like a Bradford pear that has a lot of included bark is really prone to limb breakage. Uh, trees that tend to have this more upright, what we call excurrent branching, tend to have less damage than those that are more decurrent and that have a lot of branch surface area. And even if you want, if a, a client wants one of these uh, decurrent type trees, often they can be trained. And so they have this more central leader growth pattern to make them less prone to storm damage. And we don't need to completely eliminate those susceptible trees, it just may be locating them on areas of the property where they're going to be less damaging should they fall over, not so they hang over the roof of a house or a vehicle. Um, and now's the time to kind of sell ourselves and say, you know, trees that are regularly pruned and trained are less likely to suffer problems. So if we can try to get people that are installing new plants to start pruning early and call us there early, not in 50 years, on specimens that already have issues. And part of that training is removing weak limbs, included bark, crossing branches, and just overall thinning uh, so that we have less wind resistance, and all of that just reduces that likelihood of future failure. Uh, so these are the things we really need to keep in people's minds right now as they're selecting um, new trees. And even though just to, uh, over time, what we're going to see in the next few years is a lot of trees that start to show damage and decline like we see in this central, the center image. Um, this tree was probably injured by something in the past and a fungal disease got in and that's why it's declining. So I would expect to see that uh, people who study weather related events and have said you don't usually realize the effect of that environmental disaster until two to five years after. So this is probably two to five years out. And one of the things we see here is the fungus growing on the trunk. You know, sometimes you see fungi growing in the grass. It could be growing on anything. But when it's directly on that wood of the plant that's in decline, it's probably the cause. And often those things are causing wood decay. So we would need to remove those before they fail. I thought uh, as I was putting this together every year we as we as in the extension service get tons of calls about why are all the oak trees dying and I know that arborists get them as well my trees dying and every year I've been here for 12 years I get these phone calls so I don't know how all the trees died last year but we still have this problem this year but um, and often this is the kind of thing they'll send in and I just don't think this happened and started last year but it's possible it's probably been unnoticed and I want to go over some of those unnoticed things but what I do want to say is that very often I am told that this has been, problems like this have been diagnosed as oak wilt. And oak wilt has still never been confirmed in Oklahoma in a laboratory. Uh, there's an incorrect flyover aerial survey map that says we have this disease, but we have never received a sample that ha we, are, we have found that particular pathogen in a laboratory. And this lab has been here for 40 years. So if oak wilt is present, it's at a very low level and it is not the cause of Oklahoma tree decline. What we often see, and when people tell me their trees are dying, is this is probably one of the most common problems that we see. Um, so in the image on the left, we see these blotchy spotted oak leaves. Um, as the, the lesions get larger, they coalesce. And often this is incorrectly identified as anthracnose. This is not anthracnose. We don't have the typical anthracnose that's described 
on the East Coast and other areas of the US. Uh, this is a close up of some of those same leaves on the right. And what I want you to notice is that we have these blotchy brown spots. Very often in the center, you see a dot. Um, that is where the fungus is making its spore structures. And the fungus that is causing all these blotches is Tabachia leaf spot, um, or it's, it was previously known as Actinopelte. Um, one way I know it's not anthracnose, anthracnose is going to cause vein discoloration. I don't see any brown veins. And so this is not anthracnose, this is Tabachia. The other thing that goes hand in hand very often with tabakia is if you notice the color of this leaf are not that great. They're kind of lime yellow. Um, very often, especially in rainy years, we've had two rainy years in much of the state during the spring. Doesn't mean we're out of the drought in a lot of Oklahoma, but it's been rainier than normal the last two seasons. And I always tend to see more of this after a rainy spring. This yellow color is due to a problem that we call iron chlorosis. So, Although the problem you're seeing on the leaves, it is actually a soil problem. Uh, the reason the leaves look like this with the lighter than normal color is that the soil pH is generally too high. So often we're talking 6.8 or above. And no matter what we do, it's, it, it, you know, even if you spray a fungicide or something like that, the problem doesn't go away because it's a soil problem. And it's actually amendments to improve the soil pH that are necessary to improve the overall color of the tree. Um, and so those, some of those soil amendments are discussed in this fact sheet that our horticulture department has put together. Um, there are also foliar sprays of micronutrients or injections then that can be done. And often those provide a rapid green up, the, the color of the tree will improve. Uh, and just depending on the type of the product, it can last for about three months to 18 months, uh, depending on how it's applied, but it doesn't solve the overall pH problem. So it will come back. Um, if you are making soil amendments, another test down the road is suggested to verify what the current pH is. Um, I've seen people who've made amendments and they haven't made a dent in the pH or they've actually reduced it to the point that the soil becomes alkaline. So as far as the leaf spot goes, most of the time, if you fix the pH problem, the leaf spot goes away. Um, Tubachia tends to affect leaves that are stressed. And so if we can eliminate that major environmental stress, we don't have to worry about the disease. Since it is a fungus sanitation, raking up and throwing these leaves away, you're throwing away those spores. So they're not there the next season to reinfest. Um, I, you can mulch them, but you really need to be sure that you're getting it, those spores broken down and properly composted. Thinning the canopy to improve air circulation and reduce humidity always helps with fungal leaf spot diseases. Often these trees may have like a fescue, some type of turf under them. So the timing of irrigation, trying to do that first thing in the day so that we can get the humidity and the leaf wetness on these leaves reduced so it doesn't spread. Although there have been trials and things that have looked at fungicide applications, they just don't help with this disease. So these other sort of cultural changes are really the strategy that we're gonna follow. Uh, so as far as anthracnose goes, I said we don't have the typical anthracnose that on oak trees. We see anthracnose on sycamore, but we don't have the typical anthracnose very often in Oklahoma. We have this unusual one that's called discula. So around midsummer, I often get complaints of where a shoot of a tree has turned brown and the leaves further down the branch are healthy. And so this picture isn't the clearest, but you see one here and one here and one here, um, that they're just kind of random. But most of the tree is healthy. We just have this tip die back. And so I will ask someone if they can sample this to the point where they get to green leaves. And so this would be the type of sample that gets sent into the lab. And the reason this is dying is something invaded this twig and is moving down 
into the larger wood, but it hasn't gotten this far yet. So that's why this is alive. So this transitional area is where we culture from and we look for pathogens. So if you do send us samples, don't send us the dead stuff. We need this transitional zone. And most of the time from a shoot like this, sometimes we do find arthropod issues, uh, different types of scales is, is really the biggest thing like Kermie's scale. But in the absence of those arthropod issues, usually the fungus that is recovered is Discula quercina. So it's specific to oak trees. And it is inside the twig. So although you might try to spray something, there's not much that you can spray on the surface that's going to get into that twig. So truthfully, the best recommendation is to prune it out about 10 inches back into healthy wood. And then the next season, to prevent this from happening, we want to put something protective on these leaves. And looking at uh, the different literature, it really looks like Mencozeb is the best product being applied right around the time of bud break. I kind of consider, you know, they talk about gateway drugs. Like I have teenage type kind of age kids and, you know, that and I consider these gateway problems for oaks. You start off with this little minor thing, and if you don't get it under control, you, it's a it opens that gateway to more significant problems. These should be flags that say that tree is starting to struggle, and we need to see what we can do to intervene now before we start seeing these more significant problems. And so some of the more significant problems that we saw a lot this year are, excuse me, hypoxylin or biscognioxia canker, um, which we really associate with drought stress. And we don't see it to the levels that we saw back in say 2010, but we still recover it. We may not have our big long-term drought that we had 10 years ago, but we often have these flash droughts and that seems to allow that pathogen the opportunity to get in and it does kill trees. With uh, more moisture than normal, we've seen a lot more root rot. So probably the big three have been Ganoderma, Armillaria, in Inonotus, which all make some kind of mushroomy type structure. Um, so you can look for those after periods of rain, but they are root rotters. So those are the ones where the trees get top heavy and can more easily fall over. I also want to point out that this year and last year as well, we started to have a lot of samples coming in from trees that kind of look like this. It's not that bad, but maybe the color is a little bit off. And what we're seeing is it's not just the shoot tip dying back. There's larger branches. Here's some that have already died. Another branch over here, sort of random throughout the canopy. And in these situations, we almost always recover something in the Botrysphericeae fungal family. So these are the fungi that cause Botrysphericea or bot canker. And until about two years ago, it was almost always Botrysphericea dothidia or stevensii. The past two years, it has been this fungus that's called Diplodia corticula. And this particular fungus is known in, it has been proven in other parts of the country to cause oak decline. And unfortunately, oak decline is one of those things that you're in that mortality spiral. And even if we try some of these management strategies with heavy pruning, um, correcting the pH issue, if that's why this color is off, preventing injury from lawn equipment around the base of this tree, irrigating during periods of drought, all those things, it is very unlikely that a tree like this is going to survive more than a couple of years because this pathogen is it's just kind of opens up everything uh, to happen. Um, I really think with this ice storm that just happened, we're going to see a lot more Diplodia corticula over the next few years. And these trees are just going to decline and it'll just be at what point the thinning, the premature leaf drop and all of that becomes unacceptable. Um, 
since we're talking about oak problems, I thought I'd bring up this problem, uh, Phytophthora remorum. Some of you may be aware that one of our nurseries accidentally had this introduced on dormant rhododendrons in 2019. Um, this is a disease that's primarily found on the West Coast, California, uh, one county in Oregon in forested areas, but it has been identified at other nurseries and they are under programs to monitor for it. Um, the common name for the disease is sudden oak death. I call it PRAM because Phytophthora remorum is a mouthful. Um, and I don't really like the name sudden oak death because it's not always sudden, it's not always death, and it has a huge host range. So we're, we like to call it remorum blight. Um, but this is uh, Sarah Wallace, who works with me in the lab, took this picture. Um, and if you look at this rhododendron, I think you might understand why it was accidentally introduced. I just don't see real obvious symptoms that there's a problem. And, you know, when you really start to look, did you notice this guy hanging down right here or maybe this little blighting right here? And here's another one. Maybe these are wilting. It's that could just be an irrigation or breaking during shipping issue. So I think it's understood how these things can get here. Um, so as a result, some of the plants at the nursery were destroyed as well as the plants that had been shipped to other locations. There was a very low level of spread in the nursery and in collaboration with USDA, our Oklahoma Department of Ag, Food and Forestry and our lab, we have done so many tests. Just this year, it's over 4,000 tests and in 2019, it was over 1,000 and we have had zero fines of Phytophthora remorum in 2020. So we don't think it's here. They even did what they call perimeter surveys. So sampling in areas surrounding the nursery, sampling water, um, holding ponds, things like that, as well as soil. And so we're hopeful that um, it's gone. I thought I would talk a little bit about Blue Atlas Cedar because we had, I think, a record number of Blue Atlas Cedar submitted this year. And almost all of them came in from about March to maybe May or June. And most of our extension offices were closed during that time. So it tended to be images rather than physical samples. Or if we did get a physical sample, we basically got a bare branch and a bag of needles. So, um, I, so I didn't do laboratory testing on these, but I'm gonna show you the kind of things that we saw uh, because it seemed to be widespread this year. And the question is, is it environmental or is it a pathogen? In most cases, the biggest complaint was needle drop. And so um, in some cases, we could figure it out. This is, was a common thing. We see this on other types of cedar as well. Uh, Deodar is one that I've seen it on quite a bit, but I've even seen it on some of our improved juniperus like Taylor, where the top part of the tree is, appears to be dead in the spring. Other parts of the tree are healthy. Um, and sometimes people can look in this area and maybe they find a tag that has girdled uh, the tree or some type of support wire. But very often it's just dead. And the only thing that we tend to find very often is that it's associated with in it, the lower part of the tree being protected by a fence, a house, some type of structure, and the more exposed part of the tree showing the problem. And so I suspect it has something to do with temperature and protection, but I'm not really 100% sure of that. Um, and generally, in most cases, people have pruned out this area and they've never come back. So I assume that the that it hasn't progressed. Um, but if you you may need to retrain a new central leader if you don't want the more wide sprawling habitat. Um, another thing we've seen a lot on blue atlas cedars, these may look pretty good from a distance, but when you look more closely, you notice that the tips are browning. Um, and one thing to look for is if you see any twisting or curling, anytime we see this distortion, it is usually associated with herbicide injury. 
And so you need to start investigating what was used on the lawn or planting beds, driveway as a, a potential source to eliminate it the next time. Um, sometimes we, we don't see that typical twisting, but in both cases, what the recommendation is going to be is to clip this off, uh, try to identify if there could have been a chemical source. And in most cases, these plants recover without any further uh, issue. We did have many people complaining in association with the needle drop about cracking of large limbs or the trunk. And usually this is the result of two different things. It can just be from freeze. Um, it didn't, maybe it didn't seem like it was a hard winter to you, but about one year ago, I think it was November 10th, 2019, it, our lowest temperature had been around 30 degrees in most of the state. And that night, in that day, it was about 50. Um, in the evening, through the night, and the next day, the temperatures dropped down to about 10 degrees in much of the state. So although a lot of our plants are hardy at 10 degrees, the complete drop, the fact that they weren't fully acclimated and ready for those winter conditions is probably why a lot of this cracking occurred. And it wasn't just this particular species that was affected. We've seen it on a number of trees, but it was especially damaging on Blue Atlas. Um, sometimes you get a little bit of resin flow associated with this cracking. Um, we have occasionally recovered fungi such as Cytospora, which causes Cytospora canker, uh, but this year, I really think it had more to do with that freeze event. Because these are wounds, something that you may want to monitor for is bacteria can get in there. And because the inside of the trunk is a low oxygen environment, that bacteria is forced to ferment because there's not much oxygen. And the byproducts of fermentation are gas and alcohol. <laughs> and so sometimes, especially in the spring, you will see that gas forcing sap and liquid out of the trunk. And if you smell this, it may, it smells kind of like alcohol. Um, insects can be attracted to it. Again, this isn't just a blue atlas cedar problem, but we saw it more on cedars this year, uh, probably because they developed these cracks. Um, there's no treatment. This is called bacterial wet wood or slime flux. Um, there's no treatment for it. If, if people don't like the insects being attracted to it, they can wash, use a high pressure hose and spray the trunks off. And it really comes down to just a watch and wait thing. Trees can live for years with flux problems. Um, but at some point, it, it may become debilitating to the point that removal is needed. I thought I'd mention a few fruit tree problems. Uh, this is fire blight, which is a bacterial disease caused by Erwinia amylavera. Um, it infects early in the spring and extends down uh, the branches and eventually can make its way all the way to the trunk. Uh, the main host range, mostly what we get complaints about, are apple, pear, and crab apple. Um, but really, any plants in the rosaceae family that are related to apple and pear could be susceptible. So we even see this on strawberries and uh, roses and photinia sometimes. Um, normally, the way that fire blight is managed is by selecting resistant varieties. And that's why I wanted to bring this up is because this we've ordered trees. Um, I'm not sure when they're going to be here sometime this winter after they go dormant. But we're going to start a new trial actually with pear trees. And fire blight is one of the things that we're going to look at just in terms of, of how susceptible different varieties are. So hopefully in the next Next few years, we'll have more information about that. Um, the way that this disease is typically managed on susceptible trees, most infections occur 
through the blooms. It's actually a disease that's spread by uh, in, by our pollinators like bees. And so usually you find a cluster of flowers or here's a, a fruit um, on the tip. And we can see this is discolored. Um, and so that's where that bacteria has already killed this branch. And then further down, the bacteria still may not may be present. It just hasn't killed it. So to prevent this, copper containing fungicides are applied around the time of bloom or antibiotics. There's for uh, homeowners, they really use streptomycin, but commercial could use some of these other uh, antibiotics. I wanted to bring this up because I've noticed lately there's a lot of new product registrations for fireblade control. And so if this is something that you have clients that have had a particular problem with it, um, then we may need to talk. And a lot of these before, um, at one point, I think prior to 2014, antibiotics could be used for even in organic situations, and now they cannot. Um, so those growers have just been left with copper containing products. Um, and it is a bacteria, so there's not a lot that works for bacteria, but there's a lot of new products on the market. Um, some of these are bacteriophages. A bacteriophage is basically a virus that eats a bacteria. So kind of an innovative uh, way to target this. Um, biological control organisms or biopesticides, uh, there's quite a few. Um, there's a couple different bacillus species that look to have some activity. Um, this one, this Areobacidium pullulans is looks like an excellent product, but I don't see it registered in Oklahoma just yet. Um, and then there's also what we call these systemic acquired resistance activators. They basically tell the plant, you, you know, arm, get your army ready uh, so that if this, the, if a pathogen invades, it can keep it out. Um, and some of these are compatible with tank mixes um, of your other things that you're putting out. And so if you are having a lot of trouble with fire blight, it might be something that we talk about what could work. It's hard for me to recommend fruit tree products because I don't know if they're bearing, if they're not bearing. What you use on an apple may be different than a pear or an Asian pear. So we'd kind of need to sit down and talk about specifically what you're using. I also want to point out the timing of some of these pesticide applications for fire blight management has changed. Um, I used to really think about managing this disease in the spring, but the more we've learned, especially in nursery situations, pretty much any time you prune. So if you're in there cutting or pruning or handling, then afterwards, you may want to make a product application of a copper or an antibiotic because it seems that it can spread even when we think uh, the, the bacteria has gone dormant for the season. Another fruit tree problem that we have seen in nurseries as well as in the landscape and in the retail garden center is this frog eye leaf spot. Um, and so normally it has this kind of dark border with a lighter center. I'm going to show you the frog eye here. We'll look at it now. So that's why it gets the name frog eye spot because it almost can look like an eye staring back at you. Um, with this disease, sanitation is really critical. Throwing these disease leaves in the trash because although we're talking about frog eye leaf spot, if you're seeing this on your leaves, this disease also causes fruit rot and canker. And it is very likely that you have active cankers on the tree, whether this is nursery or landscape. So you, if you're seeing the leaf spot phase, you need to be looking at the wood for evidence of canker. So I'm going to show some cankers actually on peach in a moment, but the same kind of idea will apply. Remove those cankers. In some cases in the nursery, nursery situation, if it's on the trunk, it may not be possible to keep those trees. They may need to be discarded. Um, in the landscape, a lot of pruning, you can get it out. Um, 
With fungicides, the best time, especially for the leaf phase of the disease, most of the infections are occurring after petal drop. So for timing, hopefully that helps. Um, this is what it looks like on the fruit. So not very pretty, um, but this is the same disease that causes bot canker or black rot of apple. And so that's why we need to be vigilant looking for that leaf spot phase, because it likely means the canker phase is active in at least some of your trees. Um, so what is a canker? I'm going to show an example on this. Uh, this, this is actually my own cherry tree. Um, We've had it about 10 years, and when, we when I use the word canker, it can be sunken, it can be swollen, it can be cracked, or just look different. The texture is different. So hopefully, you know, we see this nice, smooth, shiny bark, and this area just looks a little bit cracked and maybe it's starting to leak a little bit. Here we have the more uh, broken type canker that's cracking through. And so as far as prunus has gone, we are getting a lot more um, complaints about canker problems in prunus. So people finding this on young trees or established trees. And for fruit, just fruit trees in, in general, they don't tend to be as long lived in Oklahoma as maybe they survive elsewhere. Um, when you're examining trees, anytime you see this sort of thinning and decline in the canopy, be sure to follow that down and figure out where it's coming from. Um, I know this, like I said, this is my own tree. We cut this branch. I wish I had taken the picture right away, but this is a couple weeks after. We've removed that flagging branch, but this wood is already discolored inside. It was probably already in this larger wood and it looks like there's a canker forming lower down. Um, and so if you're on a, if you're at a property, I always tell people that when you first start to see evidence of these canker problems, that's the time to plant the replacement because you're going to lose this tree in the next year or two, whether you take it out now or in two years, you know, a lot of times people don't want to take them out right away. They want that fruit, but hopefully that replacement tree is uh, getting to the point where it could produce if you start. In my own landscape, we plant a fruit tree every year because that's about the rate that we lose them. So pear rust. Pear rust has been probably the most common thing that I have seen this season coming through extension educators, people emailing our sick plants email. Um, we see it in both. I've seen it in the nursery, I've seen it at the garden center, and I've seen it in my own landscape. So regardless of what stage, the age the trees are, they are susceptible. So this is the typical thing, lots of spots. It goes all the way through the leaf, and later on, this gets kind of fancy underneath. You start to get these little bumps, and later these protrusions. Pear rust is caused, it can be caused by at least four different species of the fungus gymnosporangium. And so this year, Sarah and I wanted to find out specifically which gymnosporangium was causing the rust on the pears. And so we, we collected samples from around the state and identified the fungus using DNA sequencing. And the fungus that is causing, the number one thing causing this leaf spot on the pear is what we call cedar quince rust. These gymnosporangium rusts bounce back and forth between a juniperus cedar, like your Eastern red cedar, to the broadleaf plant. And this is this picture on the left is what that cedar quince looks like on the juniper tree. So we actually, this is what all the different rusts look like on a juniper. And so if you go out, usually in about April, these things are all active. This is our cedar apple rust, these big galls, Christmas and April is what I like to call it. This is that um, cedar quince rust I just showed you. This one in the lower right is cedar hawthorn rust. It's the one that looks really slimy and oozy. It's kind of gross. Um, and then we believe this one that's on these needles here is 
Asian pear rust. Um, so they're all different gymnosporangium species that can affect pears or apples or quince or service berry um, or our traditional hawthorn. Um, during the month of March and April, uh, those things are active on the cedar trees. They are blowing spores that land on pear leaves and start the infections. And I used to think the infections happened in April, but now I believe it is actually earlier that it starts in March. And last year, my pear tree leafed out on March 1st. And I believe that if you want, I started spraying almost maybe two weeks after, even though it was still mid-March, and I could not get control of the disease in my landscape. So I really think that window is earlier. I think it's happening right when those pear leaves emerge, right at bud break. And so if you do not want these blemishes, those pears need to be treated at bud break. Um, if the infections happen when the leaves were small, almost the entire leaf can be blemished. Those lesions are going to enlarge through the spring. And usually in May is when we start to see these projections on the underside of the leaves pop out. This is when they are capable of making spores that blow back and infect cedars. So when you see those projections on the pears, if you had a juniperus you wanted to prevent the rust on, that would be the time to make the application. And this can stay active on the pears until July. Um, I do want to point out, this is where my pear started making leaves. These were the first leaves that came out this year. And by the time we got to about May, notice that none of the, the youngest growth shows any symptoms. And that indicates that infection time on the juniper was over. Um, so it's definitely a problem more early in the season. Um, here is what it can look like on the fruit. And if you see this leaf underneath, we see those spores are just tumbling out. And that's why this leaf has this orange color. This is a write-up that I have. Um, I'll bring this email address up again later, but if you are interested in it, I can email it to you. I'm working on turning it into one of those fact sheets. Hopefully we'll be out by January. So we'll have it for 2021 when everybody starts calling about pear rust. So fungicides, <laughs> uh, what do I spray? I, you told me I got to spray at bud break. I would suggest the best thing to use early in the season right at bud break is something that is from that FRAC group three. So fungicides resistance action committee group three. These are your myclobutanol, tebuconazole, propaganazole. They're very good against rust. Um, and the thing about those, it, that group three is that they are somewhat systemic. And so as that plant is pushing those leaves out, it's capable of moving uh, into that other, uh, that new growth. Um, but it is not organic. So if you're looking for something that is organic using a, a copper product uh, that has that OMRI, Omni, ugh, Omri registration. Um, and I'll say the other thing that it, in pear in particular, maybe you're worried about fire blight as well. The copper can help you um, with the fire blight, but it may not be quite as good for rust prevention as one of those frac group three. Um, I'll remind you not to use a premix that contains an insecticide around the time of bloom. A lot of the products for fruit trees are like three in one. Um, we don't want to harm those bees. And so after you've made that first application at bud break, you're going to want to rotate, use something different seven to 14 days later, and almost any other fungicide uh, that you find um, that's labeled for pear is going to have activity against the rust. Um, so it's, you'll have to see what uh, your label says. It's hard for me to talk about pear rust because we have people from the nursery listening. They may have fruit trees, but they're non-bearing. We may have ornamental pear trees that are in the landscape and we may have edible pear trees. And so I'm not gonna use any specific names for that reason. And it's gonna be more important to take a look at those labels because if you use something for a landscape pear on an edible, you shouldn't eat that pear that year. 
Um, so rotate from bud break through about the end of April is when we see the rust dry up on the juniperus species. Um, and I will say there may be limitations with some of the active ingredients as to how many times you can use it in a season or how many ounces. So you'll have to look for that uh, on your specific product labels. And if you need guidance with this, we can talk more about it. Um, but I need to know specifically what you're trying to teach or tree, excuse me. Um, so now I want to mention this thing that's behind me. So I like to put a picture uh, in my background uh, so you don't see my messy office as to something I'm going to talk about. Um, this is Indian hawthorn and this is the first time we have ever seen this rust disease affecting Indian hawthorn and it was actually a landscaper that called us and asked us about this because they had never seen it either um, and it actually turns out to be that same cedar quince rust but there is no gymnosporangium at all that is reported on raffia lepsis and so we this we're working on a first report for this, but I really think we're going to start seeing this more in nurseries. Um, and so you're going to have to start looking for this uh, on those Indian hawthorns. And anytime you see something that looks unusual or different and you've never seen it before, please, that's really what we want to know about uh, before it becomes widespread, because I think we're going to start seeing this outside of the Edmond area uh, next year. I thought I would, I, I never got back this morning. I had some technical issues. I got locked out of the room where I was going to give the presentation and I was going to add like three more pictures. So you don't have pictures for these last couple of slides, but um, I just want to remind people of two things about leaf spot and anthracnose diseases. Uh, the first is although you may see leaf spots on lots of different plants in an area or in a, a nursery, they are usually host specific. So what you see, you know, that black spot that some roses get is pretty specific to roses. We don't see it jumping on to other plants. Um, and so if you're at a property and there are a lot of leaf spot issues, it tells you there's a moisture problem that there's a lot of free moisture. And so the environment is favorable for fungal diseases, not that we have the same fungus on lots of different plants. The second thing is that I think we need to start paying more attention to what specific varieties and cultivars are giving us trouble and stop using those. I don't know why we continue to grow wimpy plants that are prone to problems. And we need to um, really focus and say, you know, we're not gonna produce as many of that variety because I'm sure, especially if you're a nursery, if you have a lot of sp spots and blemishes by the time it hits the retail market, it probably doesn't sell well. And so let's just start selecting plants that are more resistant and pushing for this. It costs us more to grow them because we're having to put a lot more product on them. I also want to remind you is that even though you probably target most of your management of diseases in the spring, it actually starts now. A lot of our plants are dropping leaves. That, that many of those leaves, if they were suffering from disease issues this year, we want to get that debris off those plants, blow it out with a leaf blower, rake it up, throw it away, and get it away from those plants so those spores are no longer present uh, to start infections the next season. So I don't have a problem with composting, healthy material, but if something is diseased, I suggest you burn it, bury it, or trash it. And just a reminder, that's this is all part of that integrated pest management approach. These cultural strategies can cut down your disease pressure, getting those products out there earlier. Uh, so hopefully you don't have major blowups of problems. Uh, also, now's a great time to thin plants and when you can really see that branching structure now and throughout the winter so that we can have better airflow. But I think if we put a little bit more effort into what we're doing in the late fall and winter, maybe we wouldn't have have as many problems in the spring. So uh, at this point, um, 
I think I finished right about on time. Uh, I'm guessing there's some questions. I'm going to leave this up for just a second. If anybody wants to jot this down, this is our phone number for the lab. It's myself and Sarah Wallace are the plant pathologists. And then we have this general email address sickplants at okstate.edu. We love to receive your digital photos, so please feel free to send them. Um, and I'll stop sharing. I don't know where summer went. So um, will the ice storm damage negatively affect pecan tree nut production in 2021? So that's a, a, a not a one word answer. Um, so pecans were especially damaged as a result of the ice storm because they were, some varieties had not even been started to being harvest uh, while others were in the, maybe they had gone through one time and then they usually go back through. And so a lot of them they had to, I know at our Perkins uh, research station that they actually had to go prune the trees and cut out the dead dying limbs before they could then shake them to try to finish the harvest. And so one thing, to consider is whether you're talking about a homeowner pecan tree or a commercial. For a homeowner pecan tree, most of the time they are alternate bearing because they don't shake their trees. So I have a pecan tree and I tend to get nuts in odd years. So we had them in 2019, we usually have it um, 2021, whatever. And so for those trees, it may not affect them at all. If you have to cut out a lot of the limbs, um, it's probably not going to matter. Um, for the commercial orchards, the first thing to do for them is to finish their harvest, to cut out the damaged branches. And in some cases, if a, especially if a tree was injured pretty low, um, they may have to just completely remove that tree. In other cases where they do a lot of pruning, we've seen this before that the trees will produce new growth. Um, and so it's just, we really want those pecan trees to have a good central leader. And if that's been damaged, then, but pecan trees do uh, tend to compensate. They'll put out new growth and it will probably have a little bit less yield next year. One of the things that they've encouraged is not giving them as much nitrogen as we normally would next year, give them the opportunity to heal. Um, and there is actually Becky Carroll just last Friday they, uh, in collaboration with uh, other departments on campus, as well as with the Noble Research Institute, did a pecan webinar that she does monthly and where she talked about um, some of the issues and how to prune and and some of this we're just going to have to assess and see how these things come out next year but the focus right now is getting everything cleaned up um, and that itself may be costly. Um, so I think you have to answer the other, the next question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David, for your question. Um, this is going to be really easy. This The question is, when I registered, it didn't ask for my license number. How do I get CEU credit? So I will be sending everyone who is attending this webinar um, an email that will have the ODAF sign-in sheet. And so that, that's the way you will give me your uh, license number and any info. And then I will submit that to ODAF once I have everybody. So you won't have to worry about that. So thank you for your question. And All so right. <laughs> someone has a question about stroby fungicides on rust. I'm not as young as I would like to be. Um, and so I have to cheat. And so I have this handy dandy. This is actually for ornamental fungicides. Um, but if you've never seen this, this is actually put together by some of you may be aware of who Ann Chase is of Chase Horticultural Consulting. And it's also put together by Syngenta. Um, and you can find this online. Um, but I think it's called the 2018 Guide to Ornamental Fungicides. It's a big PDF and it actually has different pathogens uh, across the top. So alternaria, bacteria, bipolaris, black spot, goes all the way over to rust. And one way to try, I, they, 
this is sponsored by Syngenta. So their products do come up um, a different color, you know, so they're, but they also show competitors products. So that's why I like this, but it gives you a very quick snapshot of what products are effective. And so if we look for, um, say, heritage, so the strobilurins are group 11, frac group 11. And so I'm going to cheat and I'm going to follow down rust. And so some of the things that, um, that are listed as excellent, good to excellent for rust control. I already mentioned the um, like myclobutanol and that that group three. So for instance, they have Banner Max as good to excellent. Um, Cleary's 3336, so your theophanate methyl is excellent for rust. But I'm gonna look and see what 11, so Fenstop, let's see. We don't have any ratings, so it must not be. Heritage, excellent. So that is your azoxystrobin. Um, junction, which I think is uh, has mencozeb is one of the in active ingredients, is very good. Um, mural is a combo product that has a strobilure in it, has excellent control. Orchestra is another one that um, has uh, strobilurin as excellent. So it's really looking like in general, those strobilurin products are uh, overall pretty good. So it looks like you could pick which one. And I can't remember, I have to look at this stuff up. So uh, there's just too many, I get them confused. But if you haven't, we could probably find the link to this, but it might be something that you look for online because it is a handy dandy cheat sheet that um, it has all the frat groups on it so that you can uh, quickly see what you have in your storehouse and maybe you have something. Uh, so I didn't really mean to push a Syngenta thing, but, uh, but I do like things that make it easy for me to find information. Any other question? And you all are welcome to email me or if you prefer to um, talk privately, we can do that too. And so someone has commented about mist blowers. Absolutely, especially if you have a thick, dense canopy. Um, th the thing about those mist is that the droplet size is so much smaller that you get much, much better coverage and penetration through the canopy. So that's something that, um, say I work with grape growers, we encourage them to use in vineyards because those air blast type sprayers and because you do get so much better coverage than a backpack sprayer or something like that. So good coverage is, is really important, especially with things that are not systemic, that are just protectant. Other questions or things that you wondered about that you saw this year, you can ask. <laughs> Okay, well. All right, any other questions, anybody? It's your final chance. <laughs> <laughs> it's not your final chance. Please feel free to call us and myself or, uh, you know, any uh, anyone else in extension. We'd love to hear from you. Well, Jen, thank you so much You're for welcome. speaking with us today. You had so much great information. I know everybody, um, really enjoyed it so okay. um we appreciate you being with us and uh thank you so much yep thank um, you and everyone um as as you may know ONLA webinars are live and on demand so um we appreciate you and we'll see you next time <laughs>